Uh, welcome again, sir. Welcome to the session. Yeah, yeah. We are really grateful to you, sir, for continuously supporting. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Can you just, uh, see, I have sent you the PowerPoint last night. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I have got it. I'll, I'll be playing it, sir. Screen, I will talk from yeah. here. Yes, sir. I will be doing that. Okay, there is time. No problem. There is still time. Uh, yes, sir. Take your time, yeah. Yes, sir. Recording in progress. Yeah, so now I request my colleague, uh, Dr. Vibhuti, to introduce this speaker. Vibhuti, over to you. Thank you, sir. Hello. Good morning, sir. Good morning, good morning. Vibhuti, how are you? I'm fine, sir. How have you been? Oh, fine, wonderful. Happy to see you here. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. So it's my uh, pleasure to welcome Dr. Guru Murthy Neelkantan to the five-day online workshop on capacity building through academic and research writing, sponsored by AICTE Training and Learning, and or, uh, and organized by Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Tirupati. He is a well-known academician and is currently working as professor in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Kanpur. He completed his BA from Loyola College, Madras, MA from Madras Christian College, and PhD from IIT Kanpur. He has a book to his name, Saul Bello and the Modern Wasteland. And he has also has a wide range of publications in reputed journals. He's the editorial board member of Philip Roth Studies through University Press USA and discourses social sciences and humanities, Union Christian College, Kerala. He has 13 awards and recognition to his name and has uh, three current running projects, Jewish intertextualities, modernist and postmodernist writers, and trauma and post apocalypse. He has supervised and co-supervised a number of PhDs in his academic journey. And uh, I once again welcome Professor Gurumurthy Nilkantan for the talk on this on understanding academic writing. Thank you, sir. Over to you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Vimshi. Okay. My pleasure. So how many participants are there at the moment? Uh, 51, sir. 51, a good number, good number. Select audience, but few. Excellent, yeah. So, I hope you're all able to hear me. Right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, wonderful. See, the topic given, given to me is understanding academic writing because uh, some of my colleagues from other IITs at Central University, they'll be talking about uh, research writing per se. But this is purely, I'm going to give an overview of... Uh, what academic writing is, that I will do. And then I will also supplement it by talking about something which is much more popular. I mean, uh, the business of writing uh, CVs and uh, resumes. All of us at some stage or other, um, we have to do this. And then I just uh, throw some ideas which you can think it over and uh, put it to work, right? Now, this is uh, understanding academic writing. This is my topic today. Okay. How do I move to the next slide? Okay. I can see. I can see. I'll be moving. Yeah. I can clear. This is the yeah. first slide. You keep moving yes, it from there. Yes, okay. sir. I'll be controlling you. Just let me know. Give a okay. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. See, the, we begin with the million dollar question. What is academic writing? As I said earlier in my prefatory remarks, see, academic writing is which everyone talks about, but nobody actually understands. Uh, after all, we don't uh, exactly uh, write like this when we, when you write a letter to your uh, friend or send a mail to your friend, you don't write like this. It is something, it looks a bit artificial, but then uh, if you are in a profession, we need to follow certain protocols of uh, writing. So, if you are a doctor, you have to write in a certain way. If you are an engineer, you will be writing to your uh, 
fellow audience in a certain way and so is the case for uh, lawyers and so is the case for social scientists and uh, even humanists uh, academic writing it is generally thought to be writing for communicating scientific knowledge it doesn't mean that only disciplines that uh, preeminently come under the science umbrella are covered here even people who are uh, if you are a law professional if you have a phd in law or if you have a phd in english or social sciences the kind of results the kind of uh, uh, research you are communicating that is in some sense very analytic analytic for instance as a professor of english i work on uh, many american novels but in the work itself is a creative work but the kind of uh, scholarship i develop is somewhat critical and it's quite analytic and most of it is expository writing to that extent all the academic discipline be it in sciences or core sciences or engineering or law or social scientists all this will broadly come under scientific right it is scientific has to be un understood in that uh, sense it is uh, academic writing is largely writing for uh, and communicating for uh, communicating scientific knowledge generally it is addressed to people working in a uh, field of study right so if you are a doctor probably you'll be writing to fellow doctors i mean who can understand certain jargon which a commoner may not be able to understand or if you are an engineer you will be using terms and uh, jargon which will come very naturally to your uh, fellow professionals so academic writing is also like this it's generally addressed to people working in a uh, field of study i mean when we see most of the time researchers share their research findings with their peers if you are a researcher i mean you will be expected to share your research finding with your colleagues and peers spread across the globe if you publish in a very top notch uh, refereed journal the people who read your readership consists of not the common people they are people who are experts in the field like you are and then they would like to know what exactly this gentleman sitting from india has uh, done and uh, if it is scientific they'll maybe they'll run an experiment they will see whether this research kind of uh, tally with the claims tall claims that you're making things like that right so researchers often share their research findings with their peers that will qualify under academic writing again in uh, colleges and universities in uh, portals of higher learning uh, i mean we are continually asked to submit assignments we have to write term papers we have to submit dissertations to qualify for a masters or a doctoral degree and uh, we have to write uh, theses and uh, we have to submit research reports from time to time all this will broadly come under academic writing the tone and the uh, uh, kind of prose that you use in these things the jargon that you use all that will be shared by most your most of your peers so i'm sharply focusing on academic writing in this sense and uh, if you publish in peer reviewed top rated journals again the kind of writing that you will be uh, resorting to is uh, academic writing it's you cannot write for a peer reviewed journal like the way you write for a newspaper right you cannot be very chummy you cannot be too conversational you have to have a certain seriousness of purpose so that uh, rigor is very very important for a uh, academic writing right you cannot be too informal you have to be somewhat you should have a level mature tone right this is it okay can you move on to the next slide okay one thing is clear in all forms of academic writing right be it come whether it comes from doctors engineers or social scientists ideas take center stage and people are in the background right nobody is uh, venerated it is the ideas which are venerated ideas come to the center whereas the people who talk about these ideas they are somewhere at the background they are somewhere at the margins right so and uh, if you are uh, i mean practicing academic writing every time you try to say something new you review literature and then you try to kind of maybe you build on a certain model but you also show where exactly you depart what exactly is your contribution what is so novel about what you are trying to say so you are making claims 
and you are substantiating those claims by proper evidence is very important right so adding something new to the field will also one mark of uh, academic writing and often in academic writing you have a clear argument you don't uh, just uh, trot out opinions opinions are not very important what are important is reasoned opinions you think something is better than something else then come up with a clear argument make your claims or make a proper problem statement and support it with the evidence with the solid unshakable evidence so already you know that academic writing is slowly different from uh, journalism or novel writing is very different it is you think through what you are saying you come up with a very clear argument and you support your argument with the evidence concrete evidence don't say that i heard somewhere in the corridors of power somewhere in delhi told me this no that will not work that is not evidence enough you have to bring solid evidence to the table to kind of bolster up your claims or argument uh, often in academic writing we try to understand an area what exactly is happening in an area what are the developments in that area and often it is done through literature review you have to review literature of the past at least in the recent times for the past 20 years how a field has evolved if not going back into the past at least for the past 20 25 years you see how a particular field has evolved and then what is new at the moment and then um, produce evidence again to kind of make your claims and uh, there are follow certain protocols or certain conventions you present data in a certain certain agreeable format certain agreed upon format you collect data and then you code your data or you even your analyze data as per conventions you cannot just do it in a very subjective manner it has to be done in a way with the scientific community accepts right they because the scientists are people for everything they will try to run the experiment you say something they will try to validate whether it works or not all your claims they will test so best thing is not to make uh, tall claims collect data carefully and then see if you can code it properly and then analyze your data and for everything you should be able to defend your claims right everything uh, lies uh, in this thing so i would think you no know, see when you write uh, anything uh, academic writing at least you are like a lawyer in a court of law the other way of writing is trying to be like a detective trying to be like a detective that may sound very dramatic but it's actually not useful you should be like a lawyer who prepares a brief before you go and argue before the judge you know what exactly is your conclusion begin with your conclusion and work backwards and then restate your conclusion you already thought through everything every step of your process you have thought through particularly when you write for journals this will be very very important okay collection coding and analysis of data as per conventions not completely new fangled or things like that which is something which is well thought out and well established conventions okay okay and the i mean the central focus is on the language here you understand the in a scientific treatise you use you tend to use a formal language in any piece of academic writing the language tends to be somewhat formal of course you can be semi formal but then the language is often formal and it's very brief to the point don't talk about unnecessary things so you see we say stand up speak up and shut up that is a good mark of a public speaker here also you think through everything clearly and try to be as brief as possible don't don't be a minimalist at the same time if you can say something in four words don't say it in 4000 words see you have to be absolutely brief you have to be precise you have to be accurate you have to be brief you have to be clear this is what i call the abc's of writing you have to be accurate you have to be brief you have to be clear and then you have to be simple you have to be direct and you have to be vigorous try to be always simple try to be direct try to be vigorous but let your right letting your right prose should be quite concrete surprisingly good scientists or even these good engineers i mean i have worked largely with these kind of people they themselves may not be reading novels and spending too much of time on these kind of things of course they are uh, leaders in the field 
when they write you see there is absolute brevity and the language is absolutely concrete and they are very clear this is something probably they have internalized from their own disciplines but it still it requires some thought still requires some thought so you have every discipline has some uh, internal magic that you have to kind of science has that uh, passion for brevity and clarity and directness not trying to fool around so i think that one has to internalize right so try to use formal language try to be brief and uh, this academic writing it often it is um, the way it document uh, references absolutely meticulous it is very meticulously documents sources references and it's often peer reviewed whatever you write will be um, subjected to the test of uh, validation somebody will read somebody will test your results somebody will question your claims then only they'll be willing to publish it in a peer reviewed journal whether it's nature whether it's some journal in electrical engineering or environmental or medicine doesn't matter lancet wherever it is always has to be uh, peer reviewed the peer review process is very very important so you have to act responsibly when you write you have to be fairly responsible here there is no scope for ambiguity right only one interpretation is valid see most of us if we are even when we speak if you always person to speak for 5 minutes maybe you will contradict himself once if you always person to speak for one hour you will contradict himself 10 times so i think we, the mind has this kind of a capacity to engage with the polar opposites we have to understand that so whatever we write carefully revise it look at the claims see that you are not uh, saying different things at different places so there should be absolutely no scope for ambiguity it should be very very clear there should be your uh, only one interpretation is uh, valid you cannot come up with uh, multiple interpretation for instance when you read poetry poetry thrives upon ambiguity right that is what makes a poem so beautiful you may love poetry but then you cannot use the technique when you are treating a patient or when you are writing a uh, when you have a product and if you are writing a how to use the instructions for using that product if you are ambiguous somebody might uh, even lose a life or injure himself and he will take you to a court of law right so you cannot afford to be ambiguous what is good for poetry is not good for uh, technical uh, description or even for uh, other uh, scientific fields absolutely no ambiguity try to be as clear as brief and let your interpretation be just a valid a single interpretation if it's ambiguous please understand it's not a clear piece of writing don't use big big bombastic words just to i mean uh, um, kind of put up a show it will not help try to use words which everybody understands try to aim at clarity you should have a passion for the clarity when you write and so the best thing is most of us will not be clear so best thing is to uh, revise your prose before submitting anything look at it if you have time revise it 10 times the more you revise more of uh, stylistic infelicities lapses you will catch and your document will uh, attain enormous clarity and that will be it will greatly add to your professional uh, credibility right of course we cannot go and uh, revise our lives that's not possible but certainly we can revise whatever we write and ensure that it's not ambiguous or ambivalent or uh, kind of valuing in contradictions okay okay next slide okay now this is a question i would like to ask how is academic writing different from other kinds of writing i am not saying anything new i am only kind of loudly thinking about it and then i want you to walk along with me and see the other kinds of writing you will know is journalism or some of you may be reading uh, something creative writing or something like that so let's uh, look how these things are different how how is academic writing different from other kinds of writing okay uh, journalistic writing whether we like it or not we still read uh, newspapers sometimes online uh, sometimes you may be reading a uh, print uh, journals or magazines like india today or frontline right or uh, whatever uh, magazines you are fond of how is journalistic writing different from academic writing this is very very important see journalistic writing is often found in newspapers and uh, magazines right 
I mean, uh, something very topical issues. And then you don't need to be an expert on a topic, but you have to kind of browse the topic and then give a certain opinion, a certain slant of opinion. Of course, depending upon the paper you work for, for instance, if uh, we are a journalist with the news reporting is all right, but a paper like Hindu, it will come up with a left critic of many things. The editorial policy is more uh, left-oriented. Uh, Times of India will be somewhat uh, neither here nor there. And some other uh, paper will be completely right. These are editorial policies, but then the journalistic right to use is almost the same kind of uh, language that you can see. Even the style is more or less similar. For instance, the news articles that you find, they often report, uh, report and sometimes they comment on current events. They Most of the times they report and they also comment on uh, current events. Uh, columns are often written by experts writing about current issues. Uh, for instance, in the Hindu newspaper, if you have foreign policy, you will have somebody like uh, Sugasini Aidar. Sugasini Aidar is incidentally Subramanian Swami's daughter. She is the one who is writing about uh, foreign policy, things like that. Right? Some others will be talking about uh, educational issues. Somebody will talk about uh, tax. They are experts in that domain. So columns are often written by they are expert journalists who are uh, well versed with certain current events in their area. One good thing about journalistic writing, which you can adapt in your own uh, thinking or as part of your academic writing is, most journalistic writing sharply focus on the following questions. Who, who is very, very important? Who said this? What, when, where, how, and sometimes why? They are obsessed with these uh, six questions I think we should also, whatever, when, whenever we think about a topic or whenever we try to write something, these six questions, if you address, you will have a fairly comprehensive understanding of the issue. So, in that, the best way to contextualize anything is to raising these questions who said that, what is the issue at stake, when, the, when did this happen, where did this happen, how did this happen, and why should I believe in this, why not some other thing. If you raise these six questions, it I think uh, the context is already clear. You will uh, already started thinking very systematically about what you're doing. This is something which you can learn from uh, journalism. That the other thing is most uh, newspapers, whether it is in our uh, uh, vernacular languages, whether it's in Telugu, Tamil, or Hindi, or Bengali, or even in English, they use a certain there's a certain consistency of tenses. Past tense means they use only past tense. It adds to great clarity. If you kind of, uh, there's a lapse in tenses, move from one tense to another, it will be thought to be very, very, I mean, it will confuse the reader. But spellings, you cannot uh, depend on uh, journalism because journalistic spelling is for instance, focus. The scholarly spelling of focus is F-O-C-U-S-C-D, right? But journalism will say F O. U S S E D. That is not the only single S is thought to be a scholarly spelling, whereas journalism will most of the time say double S, right? So try to use the spelling, you cannot trust journalism, but these questions of who, what, when, where, how, is, and why is very, very helpful. And journalism often targets a general kind of a readership. It targets a wide range of people, right? Wide range of people. And often it's written in a very simple style. If you're going by uh, electric train in uh, some place in Delhi or Bombay or uh, Calcutta or Chennai, you, you will be standing and then you fold the paper into eight pieces and you can still read and go. So the pro should be so clear, so clear and so simple. Everything should be foregrounded. But that is not how academic writing works. It's a bit more formal. So these are the uh, some of the differences. Okay. Okay. In journalism, the style is often crisp and attention grabbing. So you, they simply try to grab the attention of the uh, readers and the style is crisp. The sparkles with the, some kind of immediacy. The style is crisp and it's an audience centered. It's always, uh, if the reader does not uh, think, he doesn't understand, he will not subscribe to your paper. You will move on to some other paper. So I think uh, it's uh, readership centered, audience centered, and the style is often crisp and it simply tries to arrest your attention. 
and uh, in journalism often we come up with the short sentences and uh, paragraphs i mean so that people i mean the readability principles are very very important if you write a long paragraph they may not their uh, eyes may not be able to skim that effectively so short short paragraphs and in every new thought we'll have a short paragraph and the sentences are also typically quite short that's a good thing you can learn from journalism always come up with short sentences don't write very long long sentences that's not good because i think maybe in the past we were uh, there was a time and when people had so much of time people used to talk long sentences and read them enjoy them now i think everybody is in a race for time so just like journalism always write short sentences i mean one thumb of rule is english has uh, 26 uh, letters right the alphabet consists of only 26 letters ideally write a sentence which doesn't exist kind of exceed 26 uh, words short very clear concrete uh, prose this is something you can learn from journalism and the uh, headlines are very very catchy they are not always grammatically correct but they are very catchy right for instance uh, recently new york times had this uh, very startling uh, this thing hurricanes are winning hurricanes are winning so that was thought to be very very catchy and then uh, times of india came up with a startling headline average delayed losing 9.7 years of life due to pollution i mean anybody who lives in delhi would have been i mean scared out of their wits so if i live for 60 years and then already i have lost almost like 10 years okay i mean is it worth staying in this place and how to protect myself so you have to shock your readers into reading your um, journalistic piece then um, economist recently came up with this title how the pandemic became stagflationary so stagflation is uh, if uh, rahul sirogi is there he will be able to tell us it is some kind of situation where is a very situation social situation where is a high level of unemployment and also the economy is uh, slowing economy is uh, slowing there is a meltdown of economy and then um, there is high level of unemployment it can be terrible even in normal times it happens unfortunately this pandemic that we are uh, experiencing now it has brought so much of misery and mayhem to people not just in our country across the world right so now economist is, uh, is one of the very interesting uh, very wonderful uh, magazine to read not just for economists any intelligent person has to read this how the pandemic became stagflation the idea of stagnation also inflation both are it's a portmanteau word trying to kind of uh, conflate the idea of stagnation and inflation they look like contradictory things but then that's a reality of uh, the pandemic era okay mm, it often uses very creative personalized uh, language the, the very colorful creative uh, use of uh, language that is what you find in journalism you can often address your readers directly and you can afford to use very informal vocabulary right the vocabulary can be very very informal uh, for instance unfortunately it seems there is no simple way to avoid it for the love of onions sometimes you just have to cry uh, this is an article on why onions make us cry in the new york times right why onions make us Uh, shed tears, right? It you your eyes start welling up tears when you peel uh, onions. So that they would put it very uh, beautifully, right? For the love of onions, sometimes you just have to cry. And then new coinages, uh, journalism always comes up with the new usage of uh, words like uh, stagflationary, which I mentioned uh, earlier. This is the thing. Oh. of course each newspaper has its own code sometimes even magazines have their own code some general conventions they have as well but not rigid as in academics for instance a paper like a journal magazine like uh, time magazine see they have uh, phd's they have hired phd's in noun they have hired phd's who only focus on verbs they have phd's who only focus on adverbs they pay them a lot of money because the the, the idea is to reduce space and then write with utmost clarity it sometimes may look artificial but then it's a very racy kind of a prose you find in a uh, magazine like uh, time so it has its own code it has its own in house style 
Time magazine has own inner style. So is the case with the Economist, and then uh, so is the case with the uh, New York Times, and even in our own country, this uh, Hindu newspaper, Statesman, they have their own inner style, right? I mean, they are very kind of uh, I mean, they are sold out on that literally. But they have a lot of general conventions as well. But they are not as rigid as in academics. So, the academic world, when you read academic prose, there are too many protocols to follow. But your journalistic writing is somewhat free from those things. There are some general conventions. It has its own inner style, but it's not too serious. Uh, usually, there are no references for journalistic writing because often they are not trying to come up with judgments. They are only trying to come with opinions. They are coming up with some opinions. Every paper has a certain opinion. So you cannot completely go by that. Depending upon the editorial policy, I mean, somebody may be left, somebody may be center, all kinds of things. So they are only trying to give you opinions. It is up to you to believe or not to believe those things. Whereas uh, journalism, it's more like a recent judgment. I mean, sorry, I mean, academic writing is much more recent judgment. You examine the evidence carefully, you weigh the evidence, and then you look at the context and present your data in a much more responsible way. That is why scientists often, they don't uh, exaggerate. The tendency is to kind of everything examine carefully. They are not given into exaggerating thin things, right? They're very, very careful. Okay, and uh, there are not journalism also doesn't follow too many too many of this uh, jargon. All those things they don't use, right? But academic uh, prose will have uh, jargon. Every field will have uh, jargon. Uh, doctors will say uh, subcutaneous something like that. A common man will not be able to understand. Uh, a computer engineer or an engineer will use certain jargon, which other a generalist may not be able to understand. The same way people in literature will use uh, certain words, which uh, I think you will not be able to follow, or even chemist. And the language can be absolutely mind-boggling, the kind of things that they say and do, because it's very, very specific to those discourses, maybe to chemistry, maybe to electrical engineering, maybe to computer science, maybe to medicine, maybe to literary studies, but that's jargon, but you cannot use it elsewhere. Of course, journalism often uses uh, pictures, charts to explain content. The idea is clarity. So I think they will use pictures, charts to explain uh, content. Some of these things you can adapt into your own these things. After all, as the Chinese say, a picture is better than a thousand words. Engineers are very fond of using graphs, use of uh, color coded things they will put to see that uh, everything is absolutely clear, right? Okay. Now let's come to creative writing. Creative writing, of course, all of you, I mean, you may be experts in some field, but uh, you will, I'm sure you will be reading, some of them will love poetry, some of them will be reading novels, some of you will be reading popular uh, stories, popular novels, no matter what you do. I mean, creative writing is something totally different. You see, the broadly, novels, novelas, short story, poetry, plays, drama, all this will come under the domain of uh, uh, creative writing and often the writer's subjective interpretation of reality is what you find here. Yeah. Most of the time it's completely imaginary. Right? It may have some bearing on reality, but then the writer starts imagining his uh, own inner world. He constructs a different alternative uh, universe and then everything is a subjective interpretation of reality. If there is an event and sometimes even this uh, issues like gender if the writer is a woman, then the way she would interpret reality is it will be kind of uh, mediated through her gender. The fact that she's a woman, she will look at things in a certain way. She will provide a certain lens. When men talk about it, they talk about it totally differently, right? Dep depending upon where you come from, if you are one of those uh, uh, writers coming from a upper class, right? So you will, without your being aware, you will interpret reality in certain subjective ways. Or if a writer comes from a disadvantaged class and he is talking about certain social reality, he will give it a different, he or she will give it a different colors. But the fact is quite a lot of this fiction, what you find is imaginary. It may kind of make you think, make you reflect. 
it may even take its origins in a real life event but then eventually it's all imaginary right and then there is something called artistic license writers are free to distort facts writers are free to distort they will they are eminently liars right they will do all kinds of that's why plato wanted to banish poets from his republic because he thought they were telling lies but then poets also the poetry also deals with a very higher order of reality when it talks about kindness love honor those kind of things but by and large it's all imaginary and the um, creative writer has his own artistic license to tamper with uh, facts events and project it the way um, he or she wants it that's what we call subjective interpretation of reality okay next slide creative writing need not be factually true yes sometimes for instance charles dickens uh, wrote about things most of his novels are informed by uh, real life events in fact uh, after reading his works a lot of prison reform started after people started reading a novel like uh, oliver twist a lot of prison reform started taking place in england or after reading uh, a book like odd times there were a lot of exploitation was questioned in england there are some bearing on reality but uh, dickens is eminently imaginative space he creates so that's why i'm saying creative writing need not be factually true writers are not expected to furnish evidence for any conclusions they reach you can't ask writer for evidence why did you say that absolutely no evidence this is what i thought and this is what i'm writing as long as it's uh, beautifully put as long as it, it uh, moves the audience readership in a certain way it's fine it has achieved its purpose readers enjoy a piece of literary work or do not see we may write like some writer some writer we may not like and it varies from a person to person so people may like chetan bhagat of course is a popular not a great literary writer but people there are people who are sold out on chetan bhagat there are people who hate chetan bhagat right like there are writers who like some in your own uh, language some writer who is so well known somebody may not like some others will like so either readers enjoy a piece of literary work or do not nobody questions the idea of validity or credibility we are least bothered when of these things when we talk about creative writing and uh, like samuel tell taylor called it a very well known uh, 19th century british romantic poet as a poet when you are uh, in the domain of poetry or creative writing you willingly suspend disbelief that means what you are will you should be willing to accept everything as uh, real that the poet is trying to project so you should willingly suspend your disbelief fantasy wild imagination gulliver's travel think about uh, gulliver's travel by jonathan swift it's absolutely fantastic world or this uh, great work written by the mathematician uh, dobson what the uh, louis carroll his real name is uh, dobson he was a professor of mathematics at oxford today nobody knows him for the good work he did in mathematics probably he didn't do much but he, that is one of the finest works you can think of i mean if you want to understand the imaginative power of language alice in wonderland looking through the glass these are very phenomenal works sometimes you see some uh, some there, there is a writer called finishan he did a phd from cornell on uh, physics all those things but he will be thought to be one of the all time great writers right so people can be absolutely imaginative and fantasy even harry potter she creates a different order of universe and uh, she is one of those uh, billion dollar uh, novelist you can uh, Uh, think of children enjoy it even adults enjoy it but the fact is what well, this will not this kind of writing will not pass muster in a uh, academic writing we we dabble with something which is totally different okay uh, in creative writing there are certain genre kind of genre means uh, certain kind of literature for instance certain kind poetry will be different from prose place will be different there are certain conventions for creating poetry there are conventions for creating prose or what drama or novel or short stories but these things are being increasingly redefined and each creative writer has his own distinctive style the every writer will be different 
for instance uh, molly bloom she is a character in uh, james joyce's uh, ulysses and uh, she has a monologue which runs to 36 pages and it's a single sentence you will go mad trying to interpret what she is trying to say 36 pages and one single sentence recently i uh, read a book which has some 1009 pages and uh, for the most part one sentence which starts somewhere which goes till the end right so people do this kind of uh, things right so meaning is subjective in creative writing it's often open to interpretation right for instance you can ask why hamlet is indecisive people can advance different interpretations there is no one way of looking at uh, life it's beautiful but all the same this kind of uh, ambiguity or ambivalence will not apply to good academic writing okay uh, writing in interpersonal context see of course these days we don't write letters but uh, the epistolary mode is gone now we write a lot of personal emails we make diary entries or blogs social media social social media post these are the kind of things which have increasingly come to occupy our attention and here we try to communicate our own personal feelings thoughts or ideas right this is a good uh, many people maintain this blog entries they write on a daily basis they give out their feelings thoughts or ideas they also include personal judgments and uh, reflections of course these kind of uh, writing in inter interpersonal context can follow a loose structure it can follow a loose structure there is uh, no strict adherence to rules of grammar vocabulary or punctuation right the writing can be very fluid no need to be rigidly following grammar vocabulary or punctuation they also often use slangs abbreviations and mutually agreed upon codes all that they can do but uh, this is it. okay now let's look at proof text right this is the crux of uh, the first part of the lecture okay. what are the text version 1 common sense suggests that definitions in dictionaries for speakers of english as a foreign or other language should not be more difficult than the words they define this article reveals typical problems of syntactic complexity idiom idiomaticity and cultural specificity that inappropriate explanations and examples may pose for learners in so doing it also reflects a relative effectiveness of some learners dictionaries then the second uh, paragraph is corpus based genuine examples are argued to be incomprehensible as well as inauthentic for learners a comparison of published dictionaries with the functioning of a live online dictionary suggests that the detailed and painstaking explanation of a word meaning must yield to the telling example where a telling example is characterized by concreteness cultural familiarity and simplicity of structure okay now let's look at version 2 common sense suggest okay mm, version 2 learners of english refer to a dictionary when they do not know the meaning of a word what if the meaning given in the dictionary is more difficult than the word itself sound strange right but yes it can happen making learners more frustrated the way words are defined in dictionaries are not always helpful dictionaries often use complex sentences and unknown vocabulary examples given may be culturally different or uses explained may only be from native speaker context and not from where english is only a link language or is used for academic and or job purposes what is the solution to this problem a resourceful teacher may be a better alternative she can clearly explain words with with appropriate example from learners context she is aware of learners limitations and will definitely use simple language this strategy in fact could beat even the best dictionaries in the market so now the first first version and second version which one would you what is the difference what do you think i will provide the answers but then you tell me what what would you think
Which one did you found it more accessible? Okay, fine. We will second version. Huh? Second version. Second version is more accessible, right? Yes, sir. Yes. Because it is, uh, you can clearly access it. The style is simple. You know what he is saying. Okay. Now let me move to the my own this thing. Okay. Did you notice any difference between them? Okay. The first one is uh, somewhat the first one version version two. First one uses very formal language. You need to read it twice to understand what it is trying to say. Whereas the second one is informal. It uses colloquial language. First version uses no such examples. Whereas second version uses examples to help understand. First version uses a lot of technical terms. Whereas the second version uses a few technical terms. First version focus on extensive details. Second version focus on conveying the gist of the argument. First version uses academic conventions. Here, no conventions are followed. Of course, you can ask me which is better. That's not the way I'm looking at it. The first version, see, when the second version, when you talk to people, generally you should try to adopt that mode. When uh, first version may be necessary when you actually write for a journals or when you're writing for a peer community. When you're writing for a peer community, you don't need to try to explain things at length. If you do that, then you will be talking at them or uh, you should talk to your uh, peers, not talk at them. You will be insulting their intelligence. So the first one is meant for peers. The second one is most of the time we should talk like the way that is then the second one. Version one is an extract from a journal article. Uh, dictionaries are unpredictable by Amrita Valli, published in a journal of English language teaching, volume 53, issue 4. October 1999, pages 262 to 269. Version 2 is a simplified version that may that may possibly appear in a newspaper or a magazine. Same thing. Now, let's come to uh, key features of academic writing. We should have a clear and a linear structure, right? There should not be any kind of a stream of consciousness. Whatever you think you understand, you should put it down on paper. The most important idea should come up front. The most important argument, prioritize your ideas. Don't put a very important idea somewhere at the end. Sometimes we are all guilty of these things. You, whatever you've written carefully, the most important idea is like a piece of gold. Don't throw it in some corner where nobody will look at it. Pick up that piece of gold and bring it up front so that everybody sees it. Right. So the writing is, should, should have a clear linear structure and for instance a research paper will have an introduction it will you should review previous research that they carried out in the field you should raise appropriate research questions or hypotheses some is always better to work with some research questions what are the answers what are the questions for which you are trying to seek answers in this particular paper and then you should have a clear research methodology what techniques you are adopting how you have collected data, how you are going to use this data, then talk about data collection and analysis. Is your the sample is uh, sufficient or is there a problem with the data collection? Everything you should foreground. And then in a you should have a clear results and discussion section. You should try to draw meaningful conclusion after uh, doing this. And then come up with the valid references, give full details where it was published, whether it's online or offline, print version, page numbers, then sometimes it could be end notes or a, uh, if you have too many pictures, all those things, you can provide them in an appendices. Okay, this is the way it is done. Clarity is central to all academic writing. There is absolutely no scope for ambiguity. It's not open to multiple interpretations such as a literary work, right? So it should be just one valid interpretation. Clarity is very central, no ambiguity. You should have a cohesive and coherent argument backed up with the evidence. Well-established facts, details from previous study which are trustworthy, findings of experts in that field of study. Right? You should engage with the very credible sources and you should uh, bring in the experts. You should engage with other critical voices. Already other people have talked about it. Big, big experts might have talked about it. 
to kind of whatever is germane to developing your own point of view but then you should do a thorough you should have a cohesive and uh, coherent argument backed up with evidence and you should not deviate from facts you should honor well established facts details from previous study should be engaged with and this detail should this previous study should be trustworthy in themselves and findings of experts in that field of study that is how you carry forward the scholarship right if whatever findings which are done in the past if we are still stuck with them there is something wrong science is something which is continually developing uh, always you let your tone be somewhat understated don't make exaggerated claims don't say i only did this that kind of a thing will not work you should be somewhat understated let the facts speak for themselves in a good piece of academic writing you don't tell anybody do this do that uh, you don't tell i am credible i have done the best research your data should speak for itself and say here is excellent research so rather than tell show show that you have demonstrated that you have done excellent research you should, you should be understated have a cautious tone don't make too many sweeping statements right don't make sweeping statement nobody has done this before because uh, the brilliant people across the world the chances are somebody would have done it much more tellingly that's a problem so you should be somewhat cautious but you should have the cult cultural confidence to establish what you have done that's very very important understand you may do something which is remarkable you should take the credit for it and then you should uh, have the right peer community you should uh, publish your results right no figures of speech no creative use of language right write in a very straight forward referential way don't uh, write, talk about uh, in a symbolic way all those things very simple stay where your word should mean only one thing not five things absolutely clear no figures of speech no show off absolutely no ornamentation that itself is a great beauty of the scientific writing think of somebody like stephen hawking's prose right well known scientist see the prose is so beautiful so lucid so straight forward okay so and of course all good professionals are great communicators this we should understand don't think only people doing communication or english literacy people are experts no anybody who is successful in his or her own field will invariably be a remarkable communicator mm, strict adherence strict uh, can you go to the previous this strict adherence to conventions in academic writing you strictly adhere to certain established conventions and you should meticulously cite and reference reference works and you should cite properly and uh, there are clear established rules of punctuation and uh, grammar right don't take a holiday from english grammar it is very very important right without stylistic uh, infelicities your punctuation should be very neatly done and uh, full stop commas wherever is necessary wherever you pause put a comma wherever you are pausing for breath so that is the right place to there is no odd and fast about this punctuation business but uh, often after at least in america people say that too many marks of punctuation is thought to be the marks of a slow thinker right there is some sense in that both the, i will not uh, make it a pronouncement on that but it, there is some sense that the approach should be uh, racy right and then uh, is this the last slide okay okay uh, rules of punctuation and grammar should be followed meticulously then uh, this is uh, i mean ernst hemingway a nobel laureate a writer in the first half of the 20th century america he said we are all apprentices in a craft where no one ever becomes a master none of us are masters we are forever trying to learn so if you kind of embark on your academic writing journey with that kind of a spirit you are only trying to master every time you are doing something you try to improve upon what you have done earlier if you have that spirit i am sure you will go a long way in your life and career now this first part of my lecture is done the you should what is the understand the try to understand the difference between language in an everyday informal context and in an academic formal context this is very very important he, one thing is like a, just as you give a password i think a program or a code opens the same way vocabulary is very very central where to out to use language your success in life will depend upon 
this vocabulary. If you're talking to experts in a certain way, you should use that, you should internalize that vocabulary. So your field will have a certain vocabulary. It's like a passcode, password. So try to kind of internalize that. Read more, read more in your own area and develop this uh, kind of a, a strategy. Okay. Now I'll move on to the next uh, this thing. Ah, okay. This is something is uh, add on to it. I thought it may be useful. Resumes and uh, job letters. See, when you apply for a job, of course, these days people are increasingly applying over the online mode, but still some of the insights you can use for both uh, a paper uh, post application or even online mode. Okay. Now, please. Resumes and job letters. It's possible to prepare a good resume and a good cover letter only when you are sure of uh, the following uh, four principles. One is you should, you should clearly understand and articulate yourself. What is your professional goal? What is your professional goal? What exactly do you want to become in life? What exactly you want to be five years from now, what you want to be some 20 years from now, where exactly you see yourself? So that is very, very important. You should try to understand that. Supposing you say you are uh, you have finished your uh, B.Tech from an IIT or an IIT or some good place. And then if I ask you, what is your long-term goal? If you say, no, I want to become a film star, but now I'm applying for a job with Microsoft. There is a problem there. You may have all the acting talents. You may be a handsome man. You may become the great star. It's possible, but then it conflicts seriously with your immediate uh, goal, right? So you should be very clear about your uh, professional goal. And then you should understand your core competencies, what you are good at. Always try to put your best foot forward, what you are good at. See, when you begin your career, you must have uh, got trained in certain ways. You may be good in certain things. You should understand what exactly you are good at and what exactly you want to do. And you, you should have a strong grasp of what the company is known for, right? Supposing you want to work for Microsoft, and then uh, if you have a specialist in some specialization in biology, they are, you are not a kind of person they are looking for. What the company is known for, the company has a certain agenda, and you should kind of uh, bring in your agenda in sync with the larger agenda of the company. That way the company will grow and you will also grow. Your understanding of how the company can fulfill your goals. You have your own set professional goals, how by joining a company like this, how your own personal goals, professional goals will be kind of uh, pushed or enhanced, right? These are the four things you have to understand. Of course, to articulate your professional goals, you need to consider the following questions. The main thing is, as I said earlier, your short-term and long-term goals. There should not be any serious conflict between your short-term and long-term goals. And your previous training and interest you need to understand what you're good at, what was your previous training like, and what are your actual interests. And then whether you have some financial, geographical, or personal constraints, all of us, when we begin our career, we have some constraints. Uh, supposing somebody from Delhi, if he gets a job in Bangalore, and if he's going to be paid a lakh, and then some he gets a job for 80,000 in Delhi, but he has a ailing mother or a father, just for this 20,000 rupees, if he moves to Bangalore, he probably might have some problems. So that could be geographical constraints. Of course, none of us, you may not have those kind of constraints and the entire world is yours, you can go anywhere. You would have personal constraints or you would have financial constraints. So think about those kind of constraints in articulating your professional goals. And sometimes some people want to become good uh, technical people. They will not be bothered about uh, becoming a manager. But uh, increasingly, most of these uh, undergraduates from good uh, degrees, particularly these engineering fellows, they, they will be very good in the field, but then they'll work for some time somewhere and then they will jump to management because they think it's more money there or they'll get into finance, right? For IITs, you see our undergraduates, whether it's Madras or Delhi or Kanpur, they will all do there's something called time series. They get out of some professor in management, do that, and break into business analytics and then, then do an MBA abroad. That's the way they think. So, but nothing wrong with that, but you have to honestly address yourself whether you want to become a technical person or whether you want to become a uh, manager, right? 
you should also think about the type of training and experience needed for your goal um, think about is there a serious conflict between your short and long term goals and if there is a conflict how best to resolve that conflict if you go to an interview committee with this kind of confusions then they will rip you apart right you should articulate yourself clearly what exactly you want to become what are the kind of questions that they will pose so we I come in mean, kind of uh, self critical that will help you to come up with a great uh, clear vision of your uh, we will map out your professional this very beautifully right goals right next slide and you should always assess your previous training and interest uh, in assessing your previous training and interest you generate information which may be special and even unique about you for instance you might have lived in a foreign country right you might have lived in a foreign country and maybe this uh, you want to join infosys and you have for you have spent 6 months as an exchange student in paris uh, maybe you may not think uh, it's important but they will think oh yes here is a fellow who has lived in paris for 6 months and we want to establish a, our own presence in uh, paris and added to that if you know uh, french a little bit of french you are the person they are looking for this may not be look important to you but to the employer what may look important you don't know or knowledge of several languages cultures in our own country if you are marketing or something if you can know some two or three languages right it will help greatly see if you know for somebody from the south if you know hindi you have great advantage right because most people have a problem struggling to talk you go to delhi and then you do good business or somebody from north indian if he knows uh, telugu or tamil or malayalam he add it so even within the country it can be very very uh, useful so try to see we all studied we have lived we have played uh, through each one of those activities we have accomplished something we have accomplished if you are a good uh, sports person that shows some kind of a team spirit you will be able to manage a team that of course you cannot you should subtly put it that uh, you should show that you are capable of uh, uh, being a good member of a team because you were uh, in the scout boy scout you were there or you were in the mountaineering team if you are in the mountaineering team i would like to believe here is a person who can take up challenges endurance this thing subtly psychologically it uh, impacts people so try to generate as much information as possible about your previous training or about your past and some of these such as living in a foreign country knowledge of several languages or understanding of different cultures are coming very very handy this brainstorming will yield insights about your strengths and weaknesses which might help you articulate your professional vision right each of us have enormous strengths we also have some weaknesses but we need to think about it most of the times we don't think don't look at yourself through the lens provided by others think meditate on your own life have a dialogue with yourself you will be able to develop a lot of insights about your strengths and weaknesses which may come in handy in articulating a certain professional vision and then see if you are looking to work for a company how can you find out about a company the best thing is to talk to people who work for that company or otherwise you can find information in the libraries such as company publications reviews of the products write ups in financial or business sources and uh, if you have access to the company's annual reports also you can find out about the company you will always reach out to contacts in the personal office or a manager in one of the technical departments see if you know somebody who works in the company or if you don't know anybody try to reach out to somebody in the personal office try to find as much information about the role in the company what exactly the company is doing Right, you should uh, always make very profitable alliances. If a company is doing thriving very well, and if you show that uh, you also have some expertise and you would like to be a part of the team, they would like to hire you. Right. So talk to people. Then coming to it, what makes a good applicant? This is a million dollar question again. What makes a good applicant? The best thing is to think about it. See, the company has a job. There's a certain opening. maybe some hundred openings are there but there are invariably some thousand people looking for jobs in this kind of places you should try to fill a need in the company 
right? The company has a certain need. That's why they are employing you, right? Or even academic institutions. If they are hiring you, don't think uh, just they want to fill the positions. A lot of work goes in hiring people. You put one advertisement in the newspaper, it costs more than 12, 15 lakhs. At the end of it, so there are a lot of rigorous uh, process to try to hire because there's a clear need for something and you hire a person to meet that goal. Here also, he or she should, the good applicant should try to fill a need in the company. That, that's the candidate would be someone who is, uh, these are the attributes. Somebody should be well-trained. The person should be well-trained. He or she should be technically competent, right? He or she should know the job uh, well, what is required of the job. And the person should be smart, not over smart, smart, well organized, smart, um, somebody who is hard working, right? If they are convinced that you are a hard working person, people inherently know that, I mean, they will trust your credibility, right? Hard working, that you are a reliable person, that you are honest, you are a person of uh, integrity, you are a person of uh, integrity, right? And then you are well organized, you are not uh, confused, things like that not a scatter box, you're well organized. And if you come out as somebody who is friendly, who is courteous, resourceful, somebody who always has a smile on his face, not as a foolish grin, but a smile. I mean, you should be friendly, right? That's it. And uh, most important qualities, you should be a good communicator. Everybody likes a good communicator. Somebody who speaks well, somebody who talks to the point, somebody who is pleasant, somebody who is not confused. So, I mean, at least we should, most of us will have few of these attributes we will meet, but we should try to um, achieve as many of these attributes as uh, possible. If you think communication is not your strength, try to work on your communication, try to speak well, uh, try to write in a simple direct way, something like that, I mean, work on those things. Of course, your cover letter and uh, resume need to demonstrate all these uh, attributes which I was talking about. If your cover letter and resume exhibit good writing skills, they can at best get you an interview call, right? If, uh, if they're too, you may be technically brilliant, but if your cover letter is poorly done with uh, mechanic, with uh, stylistic and grammatical mistakes or uh, with uh, uh, font size changing from one line to other. I mean, invariably people, they think you are a sloppy. You are absolutely sloppy. Your technical skills also will be equally poor. Of course, there is no logical reason why somebody who is sloppy in this way should be sloppy there. But then uh, this is the, usually that is the way people look at it. So best thing is to have a very, to exhibit good writing skills in a cover letter and resume it will certainly help you get an interview call. And that is off the battle one. Of course, your technical competence can only be judged by interviews, tests, letters of reference, right? Of course, if you have all this, if you write uh, well, and if you're organized, okay, they will think, uh, they'll be impressed. But then eventually they're hiring for a particular job where these skills are important, but not as important as uh, how you give the interview. Your competence will be judged by your interviews, your test, and the letters of reference you get from, uh, um, I mean, the referees, right? Of course, when you resign your cover letter and resume, you should use a conventional format, right? See, this, I'm not going to talk about these formats because any book, uh, any book or many of these resumes from companies like Microsoft or Intel will give you beautiful formats. Simply follow those formats. Use a conventional format. And important thing is stress what you can do for the company, not what it can do for you. Some people, when they come for a job interview, they will ask, will you give me a seat grant of 30 lakhs? They will like to take too many things from the system. But in return, what you can do for the system, that they will be silent. That you should not be like that. Like John F. Kennedy said, think what you can do for the country, not what it can do for you. This is the idea. Stress what you can do for the company, not what it can do for you. This is a you attitude, right? I am part of the team. These are the things I can do for your organization. Use some of the language the company uses in its job announcement. See, whenever you see a job announcement, pick up some of the language that they use and then 
repeat it in the way you organize your cover letter and resume. Right? After all, everybody, if you repeat somebody, they would like it. Right? We all have an ego. And then if you repeat, then okay, this is what I thought was interesting. This fellow seems to uh, internalize that. Evince your interest, show your interest, demonstrate your interest in becoming part of the team. Right? And then this is very important. And you should address the person who has authority to fix an interview. Don't write to everybody. That's not going to help you. In fact, it will kind of affect your credibility. You should write to the person who has the power to kind of arrange your interview. Don't waste your time writing to everyone. Always test your accomplishment. Always emphasize your accomplishments, your responsibilities. In talking about your accomplishments and responsibilities, use action verbs or a dynamic verbs. These are called action verbs or dynamic verbs. Uh, don't say I undertook uh, research. Simply say I researched, I organized, I fabricated, I supervised, I created, I improved, I developed. These are all action verbs. It shows you are a man of action, you are a woman of action. Don't write long, long sentences. Use with a lot of punch, use these action verbs. And the good engineers, most of the time, you don't need to tell them, they automatically get these things, right? And uh, make the letter and resume look elegant. Don't try to make it uh, too uh, beautiful, though that kind of thing, don't get it, right? It should look very simple, neat. It should be elegant. You should have a professional image. And this is no place for spelling mistakes, or typographical errors, or formatting flaws. Right? These are all mechanical errors may creep in. That's why you should try to revise these things as many times as possible. Right? Okay. For instance, in designing the letter of application, familiarize yourself with certain conventions. Uh, the letter of application is usually only one page long and it has four main sections. Like the heading, the heading is the writer's address the reader's address and the date on which you are composing the letter. You should have a first paragraph which introduces you and then establishes the company's need and your ability to fill it. First introduce briefly and then establish what the, what the need of the company and then how you can address that need. Or you can see if you are sending a forced application, unsolicited application, the purpose behind your writing. Why you are writing this mail? That should be very clear. Why you are writing what you are writing? That's very, very important. The purpose behind your writing and what you are requesting of the reader. At the end of the thing, you want a person to do something for you. Right? So what is that? The purpose behind your writing and what you are requesting of the reader. This thing should be clear. You are maybe are writing, uh, asking him for an interview. So, or asking him to consider you for the job. That should be very, very clear. And the second paragraph, or maybe a series of uh, small paragraphs, detailing your most relevant experience and qualifications that bear out your accomplishments, responsibilities, and the quality of work. In the second paragraph, ideally, you should talk about your most relevant experience. Whatever uh, job you're applying for, pick up the most relevant experience where you have some expertise and your qualifications that bear out your whatever accomplishments, responsibilities, and quality of work. This section should show evidence of your good work. Somehow you should demonstrate that you've done good work. This can be done either by citing a reference, so-and-so will give a reference for this. I worked as an intern for a Microsoft in Bang Bangalore. Uh, Mr. Uh, Wheeler will give the reference, right? Because he was your... Uh, um, supervisor or somebody who mentored you there. Or some objective measure of uh, jobs quality. Some objectives, you work for a financial institution, you came up with the model, the company, I think, it's a global organization like uh, Nomura or BlackRock, and they have saved something like $200,000 in within 15 days. So if you have evidence to that, you can say that. And then you can even say so and so will uh, testify to this or give a reference. And a closing paragraph, providing any other pertinent data, any other relevant data, you can uh, mention it in the closing paragraph. And this closing paragraph should request a clear uh, for an interview 
and you should give telephone numbers and mobile numbers where you can be reached right give numbers where you can be don't give numbers where uh, which numbers you will not even uh, use give one or two numbers where you can be reached of course in the cover letter there should not be no space at the bottom it should be balanced and visually attractive suppose you write the entire letter in four in a white page a4 size paper half the letter is full the remaining half is all empty i mean without the reader who is reading the your letter he would reasons to believe in a psychological way you would have reasons to believe that your life is full of empty spaces right i mean nobody should have empty spaces in life so organize the letter in such a way that it's not too cramped with a sufficient space but then not too much of space at the bottom you should be balanced and visually attractive right should be balanced and visually attractive designing the resume you see this is design business is very very important not just here designing houses designing cars right whatever the buildings of uh, academic institutions the design thing is a design thinking is very very crucial that applies to even your resume and job letters designing the resume your resume what is a resume it's a structured written summary of your educational and employment background it is a structured written summary of your educational and employment background and it often shows your qualifications for the job it often shows your qualification for the job it summarizes all your activities and experience it uh, repeats most of the information in the letter of application though it's much more inclusive and uh, this resume should highlight your most important qualification don't talk about small small things the most important qualification should talk about see the often the letter and the resume are likely to be separated that is all the more reason why the data which you put in the cover letter should also most of it should find a mention in the resume also see because the letter will be taken away by some maybe dealing clerk or something for filing purposes so that means they are going to give you an interview but then the resume goes somewhere in the review resume is empty the interviewer may not even know what to look for in your resume and he will be forced to bring the letter and then look at it so most of the information in the cover letter will be repeated here but in a much more inclusive way you should summarize all your activities and experience and uh, that's the way okay mm, let's look at some of the key characteristics of a good resume you should be neat you should be simple you should be accurate you should be honest without making too many tall larger than life claims You should be honest, right? And your resume should be easy to read, right? It should be easy to read. It should not be too long, not too much material crammed on the page. Few short phrases, then full sentences. Few short short phrases, then full sentences. You should have visible headings. Mm, it should have the vital statistics like name, address, telephone numbers, permanent address. These things should be there. when you in career you should talk about where you are headed professionally right goals you need to talk about your career goals where you are headed professionally qualification and experience you can see where you have when you talk about your qualification and experience it should show where you have been already right that's it the ordering of information is very important in the sections on qualification and experience for instance you should always as a rule you should put your most relevant and impressive qualifications up front right if you have relevant work experience list that before educational experience right otherwise emphasize your education and its special features supposing after 5 uh, years after your uh, degree from iit tirupati ha uh, you should not talk about that you should talk about the experience uh, gained in the companies but then whereas uh, if you are a fresh candidate then maybe you should talk about your undergraduate days in uh, iit tirupati and you might have done some courses which may be very very relevant for the job in question right so you can talk about your education if you don't have much experience but if you have acquired enough experience 
foreground your relevant experience and push your educational experience to the bottom. Okay. Okay. And you should also have a section on honors and extracurricular activities. What you list in this section will show that you're organized enough to handle several activities at one time. See, when employers are typically looking for people who can do, who, are, who can be good at multitasking, right? I mean, who can be trained to do many things, right? They, they want to develop you into a leader, right? They want you to develop into a leader. Whether you like it or not, eventually we all have to do some administrative or managerial things, right? So what you list in this section will show that you're organized enough to handle several activities at a one time, multitasking. Include miscellaneous information that relate to your career objective, maybe command of other languages or computer expertise or date on which you can start working, availability of references. If they want to contact somebody to find out about you, then you should be able to list those things after taking permission from your referees that they'll be willing to serve in that capacity. Uh, most recruiters prefer the chronological plan I mean, a historical summary of your education and work experience, right? That is what most people would prefer. And then you can send paper copy resumes. In doing this, you should pay particular attention to the visual impact of your resumes. And you should strive to keep your resumes relatively short. Use white space effectively by providing adequate margins. There should be adequate margins on uh, both the sites. Use a font size and a font style that is easy to read. Okay. This is very, very important. Don't come up with too unconventional font. Uh, this Use a font size which is and a font style which is easy to read, not too complicated. Design your resumes with busy readers in mind. Right, Arranging information so that it's easy to read. Always arrange your information, prioritize your information because you are the person who reads your document he may be a very important professional. You should help him to like your resume in some ways, right? So put whatever is important about you upfront. Since many people may handle a resume, it's better to put your first initial and the last name followed by the page number at the top right hand corner of additional pages. If you have additional pages, then you have to kind of identify that it's your document put your first name initial and then your last name, right? And then number it, that will take care of it. And always use best quality paper possible for your resume and cover letter. Don't use very kind of bad paper or blotting kind of, use good paper. Good quality of paper you should be very, very important. Okay. This is the most important. Edit your document with enormous care. Whatever you are submitting to the world, you should see that it's a, you have spent enough time on it. Edit the document with enormous care. Triple check everything. Read three times at least. See that there are no uh, problems. Triple check everything, including the spelling of your name, your address and phone number, and the dates in your education, right? If you mess up with this, then it may, may not show you in good light. And the employment sections, right? Wherever you work, give the proper dates. After you're through, ask another person to look at the resume critically and alert you to the stylistic infelicities and for possible improvement in layout and the content. Always ask somebody whom you trust, maybe a friend, maybe another senior person is a professional himself or herself. Ask that person to look at the resume critically and the alert you to the stylistic uh, infelicities, stylistic lapses in grammar, in style, whatever. Uh, also ask if you can improve the layout and the content of the uh, your resume. Okay. Next. Electronic resumes. These days increasingly people are asked to submit their uh, resumes online. Recruiters search the resume databases for applicants with specific kinds of experience, attributes, and skill sets. See, recruiters look for, they search these databases for applicants with specific kinds of experience, attributes, and skill sets. You understand that. 
So you should prepare a computer friendly document. Computer programs find a recruiter's list of keywords and identify those resumes that provide the best possible match. These programs will have a way of identifying the best possible match between the recruiter's list of keywords and those resumes that demonstrate these skills. You should therefore present your qualifications for a job through keywords a recruiter is most likely to use. Uh, of course, if you are uh, submitting scannable resumes, use a format that uh, ensures optical character rec recognition program and that accurately represents the information on your uh, paper copy, right? So you should accurately represent the information on your paper copy. So use a format that is uh, friendly to uh, OCR, uh, let's say, optical character recognition program, okay? It's always better to create a format that is stripped to the bone, such as uh, this is one this is American standard code for information interchange or plain text file, right? Create a format that is minimalist in some way, such as the American standard code for uh, information interchange or plain text file. Try to list as many facts, skills, and attributes as possible. The more information and keywords you produce, the greater the chance a computer program will match you with the position, right? <clears throat> it's always better to use keywords and then the chance of the computer program matching you with the position is uh, quite big. <clears throat> Since you're dealing with a computer program, use here descriptive nouns and noun phrases wherever possible. For example, a program will search for nouns such as surveyor, programmer, and manager rather than corresponding action verbs. Surveyor, it will not understand because it's not a position. It is surveyor, it will understand. I program, it will not understand. The position is programmer. So those kind of things you have to make, uh, noun phrases you have to use. And uh, rely on, uh, rely on technical language and uh, uh, current industry buzzwords and technical acronyms because it will look for these kind of things specifically, okay? Also include uh, as many facts as possible. For example, write your six years experience as manager of a software development group. Always left justify the entire document, avoid columns and use at least one inch margins. Use standard fonts and reduce formatting features to the minimum. Avoid the tabs, italics, underlining, brackets, bullets, dashes, horizontal or vertical lines, shading, symbols, and uh, pictures. These things it will not be able to recognize. Use white space to indicate where one section ends and another begins. If the resume is printed, use white paper and a laser printer to produce crisp dark type on one side of the page only. No need to fold or uh, staple the document. If the resume is to be emailed, save the file in the uh, ASCII or plain text format. Okay. okay. This is uh, one book which will be useful for uh, this kind of writing a resume. Okay. I am done with my talk. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to interact with you. Okay. Please feel free. This is the first lecture in the session. We literally set the tone for what other people are going to say. I'm sure they'll come up with very interesting ideas. So please feel free. So the floor is open for questions. If you have any, you can ask. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh -huh. This is this is Anupama, uh, uh -huh. principal uh, KC International School, Jammu. Uh -huh. And uh, sir, I, I just have one query. Like uh, when when we see any CV, uh -huh. so or when we uh, create or design any CV, as mm -hmm. you rightly said that we have to go by the prioritization of the focusing things, right? We have but, to go uh, by what is it? Go by? You have to we have to be very very you know giving the priority to your important thing to be uh, focused on uh -huh. uh, the important areas of your domain, important areas of your thing. That's uh -huh. fine, but. Uh, the thing is that if a CV is very lengthy, mm -hmm. how to uh, sum up in a short? 
okay yes this is a good question but you see probably this uh, when we do this we usually think of uh, biodata is very the biodata will list everything right but in a cv and resume because uh, see the principal of a school also will not have that kind of a time there's so many administrative yes, activities yes, yes, and yes. i think they should be strongly advised to stick to the two page not more than that actually sometimes there we used to have you know six six pages cvs and i feel that the cv is very impressive it's uh-huh. really very very good uh-huh. at the same time like if everything is very fine of course i'll look for those things which is required for that domain but then mm-hmm. how to suggest the person if the person is you know like keep on adding things and for the internal posting of any position or for any kind of you know appraisal so when mm-hmm. they start they appraise themselves so mm-hmm. how to guide them to have their entire thing in a concrete way okay the only thing you can do is maybe you can organize a workshop see you may have very intelligent uh, colleagues people who work with you but they may not be trained this way So yes. maybe you can give them a training, maybe two days workshop on CV writing or internal communication within the organization, writing yeah. notes, writing memos. If they can be trained to write effectively, then it will be good. Sometimes people will write unnecessarily. Sometimes in the eighties, yes. ah, uh, see so even governments, the British government invested. Uh, they have started a project called the Complete Plain Words. the english people did not know how to use the english in the official uh, context very true very uh, true sir so they spent so much of money and then at the end of it they came up with a book called the complete plain words say things in a simple direct vigorous way accurate brevity clarity that kind of a thing. yes yes so i think in our forest most of us english is uh, not a native with this thing <laughs> there are complications we understand actually, that actually. it should be sympathetic so we should organize maybe some workshop or something with the local talent and then we can get it done it's not a problem fine sure sir i'll, I'll uh, try my best to guide them that way but when it comes to that uh, annual appraisal uh, the place and the column where it is given if anything else you want to share i find uh. that even you know there is a 5 6 10 uh, pages which they keep on writing keep on writing and mm-hmm. after that it is very difficult to summarize the entire thing sir i know i know it can be very very irritating i understand that not irritating but it it is it, it, it takes time for me to decide on yeah see after all you know this they are pages. given the instruction to see the priorities but for them everything is a priority yeah you can summarize the entire thing in one page the most important thing but everybody wants a kind of go put padding they want to make uh, look they they think cv really weighs on you in some way yes That's sir problem is more a problem of anxiety but actually you can summarize the entire thing in one beautiful page giving your most important relevant qualifications that would make life uh, easy for you and also for others right Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, we'll pleasure. try my best, sir. Thank you yeah, so much. Well, you are from Jammu, eh? Jammu? Not from Jammu, sir. Basically, uh-huh. from Maharashtra, Pune. Working uh-huh. in Jammu. Okay, okay. Very good, very good. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Fine, man. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you yeah, so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. Any other question? Please feel free. Oh. I will be very. Namaskar, sir. Namaskar, namaskar. Sir, I am Dr. Kabir Seni from Jaipur. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Sir, I I have a one very small question, right? For example, like after working in the uh, academics for so long, right? Uh-huh. For example, like twenty years or twenty five years, is it okay to reduce some old data from your CV when you apply somewhere else, or uh, we should? keep all the research work done since beginning till date because as ma'am has pointed out very well uh, like if you work in this particular area from so long your cv gets bigger and bigger yeah yeah, yeah. so is it okay to eliminate some facts which are like you know uh, very old uh, because or we should only share data for la- for example last 5 years only because academically we have case writing research paper so it becomes uh, become very big no no that is true see you can probably see if you done a uh, whole lot of research talk about five most important publications by which you would like to be judged 
which you think are central to your uh, i mean professional journey five most important publications uh, it could span maybe two three decades most important things two or three major responsibilities you have done there may be hundreds of committees you might have been a member but that's not going to help take the most important thing these are the highlights of my career this is what i have done that to be far more effective than talking about small small details only the gold and diamond you put up front yes. silver you can keep it for use later right <laughs> that's okay. the thing thank you so much sir okay thank you any other questions so one question please no please yeah so these days one page resumes in which everything is divided i mean they demarcate it with the line the left portion will include say extra curricular and all that and the right side will include projects um, are these suited for indian uh, academics or indian recruiters see if there is they want the information to be organized in a certain way you go about doing that but these days what happens is there are many of these multinational companies they whether microsoft bangalore or uh, any of these companies like intel bangalore or delhi and uh, intel in uh, san jose or uh, california somewhere see there almost the work culture is the same and they expect you to follow the same norms there are uh, this uh, uh, rosemond in america will uh, will have insist on the same cv that uh, a ceo in uh, microsoft bangalore will the format is almost the same but maybe for some indian companies the format may be different best thing is to follow the inno style in that case otherwise you can simply follow this model because everywhere it's becoming the same now more the world because of thanks to this globalization lot of things are changing the workplaces even if you see the workplaces the way our young fellows dress in a software industry is not very different from how they dressed in silicon valley everything has become standardized in some ways so cvs are also like that so you can if in the absence of anything you can go ahead with the cv like that. i think the main thing is it should be brief and clear you should not be cluttered okay right? you should not be cluttered you should not give too many unnecessary details if you have done 10 projects only if three of them are worth talking about then talk about those three right that, that is the way if you may see if you are a fresh uh, just graduated out of college and applying for a job as an engineering student you might have done some 40 50 courses but talk about some relevant courses which have a bearing on the current uh, job you are applying for maybe you have done a design course or maybe you have done a course in programming or something like that which has some bearing on our coding which has some relevance talk about those things rather than some other course which may not have any bearing at all the important thing is selectivity in those things how to present yourself how to catch the somebody's attention those things are becoming more and more important see from your perspective see also from the perspective of the employer just now one of the speakers she was saying managing a school and then you have lots of responsibilities is not just uh, interviewing and taking people every year there will be lots of experiences you will be torn between under commitments so i think if people already are internalizes and submit resumes which are quite uh, workable then life becomes simpler for everyone right so there's a follow standard uh, formats in this that's what i would say but if the company wants this format to be, to be done in a certain way follow that nothing wrong with it okay sir thank you bye bye any other questions any other questions okay so should we conclude this session if you don't have any questions okay let them at least give their feedback for all the talks at the end of the workshop oh, yes, please circulate a feedback form 
take the sir. feedback and then let's see if we can improve it even further in the next uh, this thing you've done an excellent yes, job sure, but sir. i think we want more participation from across the country we should uh, do this right Very sure good. sir Sure. Thank you, all of you. I don't know you personally, but uh, it was wonderful interacting with you. Uh, my pleasure. Uh, I have a great, yeah. have a so wonderful much. three, four days here. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. I have a great life ahead. Okay. Thank, thank, you. thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye bye. 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 Thank bye. you, sir. Thank you very much for bye this lightning talk. <laughs> thank bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye.